Um, good, good morning, everybody, and um, welcome to this keynote address sponsored by the Agronomy Society. So um, in case you don't know, my name is Craig McGill, and I'm president of the Agronomy Society of New Zealand. Um, so the Agronomy Society was founded 50 years ago in 1970, and today we're going to have a review by Nick Pike on 50 years of agronomy. So in fact, those doing the maths would work out that um, the 50th anniversary was in fact in 2020, but once again, this presentation has been delayed since, for, uh, due to obvious reasons since, since um, 2020. So that's, that's um, starting to get a bit of a familiar theme to it, but nonetheless, we're very pleased to have Nick Pike, who can't be here with us, but will stream in to present 50 years of agronomy. So just a little bit of background on Nick. Nick Pike is the founder and director of Ag Innovate Limited, which has a focus on supporting innovation through high quality applied research and delivering, and delivering benefits to New Zealand food producers and the agricultural, and, and agricultural industries. I'm sure that Nick is very familiar to many of you as Nick was CEO of the Foundation for Arable Research for 20 years, so he's in fact CEO from its innovation and from its um, in, in formation and then for a further 20, more than 20 years. Currently, Nick is Chair of Agmart, Director of Cropmark Seeds and Pamu, and chairs the advisory board of the Old Distillery, which some of us had the pleasure of visiting um, a few days ago. So with that, I'd hand that over to Nick and invite him to give his presentation on 50 years of agronomy. Thank you. Thank you. A kia ora tātou, ko puki hoi hau te monga, ko mauka o te awa, noi autotahi a hau anane, ko Nick Pike taka anoa. So apologies that I can't be there with you. It's um, even with uh, modern travel, it's not possible to be in two places at once and be in Invercargill um, at this time in the morning. And uh, so I hope that um, what I'll share with you um, is able to be followed through and that uh, you get some idea of where the arable industry um, in New Zealand has come from and hopefully a little bit of a perspective of where it may land in another 50 years. Um, so starting off looking at the slide that hopefully is in front of you, you'll see on the um, left hand side there's a researcher standing in a very tall crop so that's going back another 10 years from the 50 years and and subsequent to that we had the innovation of um, shorter wheats through the green revolution so 1970s we had wheat that was significantly shorter higher yielding and is harvested with a machine such as you see in the background there the interesting thing is the method of harvesting has not changed in 50 years. Pretty much everything else may have done, but not much in, in how the machine that harvests the wheat or the grains or, or seeds operates. In 1970, we also had a um, significant involvement in testing the quality of wheat and bread in New Zealand and the Baking Research Institute um, checked the quality of, of flowers and by doing bake tests. Fast forward to 2020 and the method, of, the size of the harvesters has changed, the method of harvesting hasn't, but we also have some significant um, things to celebrate in New Zealand and that the world record for wheat is held by a New Zealander, Eric Watson, who's standing there um, in the wheat crop in that picture and um, that yield is at 16.9 odd tonnes, so very significant yield. There's been significant changes in people's perception around uh, the grain and cereal products in that time and so we've got a huge increase in, in the emphasis around gluten free which will impact on where um, breeding goes with cereals going forward. In the first Agronomy Society conference in 1971, there were a number of papers presented, um, 26 papers in all, and they covered a wide range of topics such as barley cultivars, plant spacings and row spacings for maize, direct drilling of maize, 
uh, irrigation of peas. Some wheat selection work and mineral nitrogen in, in two different soils under different management systems. Now, any one of those titles could be an effective title on a paper that's presented to you today. So hopefully we've made some progress over the 50 years. At that same conference, Dr. Harvey Smith gave the presidential address. And he said in, this, in his address, that there needed to be a greater emphasis placed on breeding hybrid crop varieties, breeding high quality processing crops. And both of those things have occurred, although not so much emphasis on hybrids, but definitely on breeding better varieties. Husbandry of new crops, and we had things like peppermint and drug crops in that mix. Now there has been an awful lot of work done on new crops, but we haven't seen a huge production of new crops except for vegetable seeds, um, irrigation and fertiliser requirements for crops and developing intensive cropping and pasture systems. And both those areas of research are obviously still going, ongoing. And more recent in recent years, we've seen more focus on farming systems and cropping and pasture systems, but potentially an area going forward with the environmental challenges that may need some more work. In 1996, um, there was a presentation to the Agronomy Society and the person who presented that said that the arable industry has good practices from an environmental perspective, um, that new technology and products will provide effective solutions, that information will be rap rapidly implemented and that person also predicted there'd be world shortages of grain um, and would place the industry in a sound position. I don't think at that time I intended in saying that, that we would be waiting um, as long as we had to see that world shortage of grain. I also was that person that made these comments. I made some other comments which haven't necessarily been followed through to the extent that they that I thought they would have due to a range of things. So the molecular techniques have not been able to be integrated into our um, arable farming systems. Remote sensing while used is not used as extensively as what it could be. Crop modelling saw a, an interest from the farmer's perspective um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, but is widely used by the researchers. We're seeing interest in biopesticides, obviously limited number of registrations of such products. But integrated pest management has started to take off we're seeing variable rate application, limited use of disease and peace production, and limited, not, not as much use as I would have expected of things like yield maps. So I'll touch on some of those topics as I go on through this presentation. In 1970, the crops, the major crops, um, were largely similar to what they are today and they're listed on the side there of that table. The major change is a large increase in our seeds production from 1970. We did have forage seeds obviously being produced in the 1970s, but the um, increased uh, production of vegetable seeds and the increased focus on exports, so that we're now at 260 million of exports, has um, certainly been a growth from 1970s. Some other significant shifts on that in that time frame are the wheat the tons of wheat produced in 1970 was 380 odd thousand now 460 and that 460 thousand is produced from about half the area that it was in 1970. we do have exports of wheat um, or flour products or baked products and they're around about 170 million dollars the unfortunate thing at this point in time is that many of those exports of wheat or baked products are from um, imported grain. And hopefully we're starting to see a shift in that in the current period and we'll see a greater emphasis on New Zealand grain for milling within New Zealand and for um, baked products for export going forward. In the case of maize, there's a doubling of the tons produced in that time frame, and the areas pretty much stayed the same. 
for a crop such as potatoes. I couldn't find the tons produced in the 1970s, but there's been not a huge shift in the tons produced over the last 20 years from around 500,000 to 530,000. However, the yields have obviously increased because they're produced on a, re a lesser area. The only one that's shown a significant decrease in tons produced is processed peas, reducing from 1999 uh, at 78,000 to 66,000. And obviously, as part of that, the area has decreased as well. So what's happened with our grain production over that period of time? If we look firstly at the barley production, so that's hopefully the orange dots on what you see in front of you, it's the actual tons produced in New Zealand has not increased that much. It's increased from about 350,000 tons to around 400 or just a shade under 400,000 tons. However, you'll notice in the mid 80s, there was a huge peak in barley production for a short period of time. And that aligned with when the New Zealand Barley Society was formed and was exporting barley. Unfortunately, that was short-lived and we very quickly returned to the sorts of tonnages that have been produced in the past. If we look at the blue line, uh, the wheat production, the tons have increased in New Zealand from about 250,000 up to around the 400,000 tons. And again, there's some um, movement around that line. The most noticeable ones around 1986-87, when the wheat, New Zealand Wheat Board was um, dissolved and the bakers, millers, um, were allowed to then import wheat from overseas. So up until that time, all wheat used for within New Zealand was um, New Zealand grown wheat. At that stage, they were allowed to import wheat. And at that point, it was clear that the quality of the imported wheat was, not, uh, was better than what we could produce in New Zealand. That trend has changed over time. And so we now produce some of the highest quality wheat in the world. But if you look at that consumption, with only uh, 1970, we're producing, um, consuming 400,000 tonnes. In 2021, about just under a million tonnes of wheat in New Zealand, of which we're still producing less than half of that currently in the country. In the case of barley, our consumption is about equivalent to what we're producing. So to feed both ourselves and the animals, we've seen significant imports of both grain and PKE over that period of time, and particularly of wheat, um, a little bit of maize, but the most significant increase in imports has been in palm kernel, where it's increased from nothing around 2000 up to around 2 million tonnes and static around about that 2 million tonnes at the moment. If that feed had been supplied from New Zealand grains, then the production in New Zealand would be obviously significantly higher than what it is today. As well as importing baked, uh, sorry, exporting baked products, we do also import baked products and we actually import more baked products than what we export. So we import about $270 million of baked products. Unfortunately, most of what we grow, produce in New Zealand are commodity crops. And so they're, they're very volatile to what's going on with the world price. And this is a graph from um, just 2000 through to earlier this year um, of the wheat price in NZ dollars X Gulfport US. So it would be of imported grain into New Zealand. But the New Zealand price mirrors what goes on internationally to, to some extent. And you can see that it has been fairly volatile over that period of time. Some of the peaks and troughs are easy to explain. So then 2008 was the GFC. And after that, um, we saw a significant drop in the 
price of wheat. The recent spikes, everybody knows what the causes of that are, are two causes, the impacts of, of COVID or the global pandemic, and more recently, the big spike being the in, impact of the war in Ukraine. Unfortunately, these prices do feature through to our prices of grains in New Zealand or of the commodity products we produce. Over the period of time from 1970 to, to today, yields have improved, increased quite significantly, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But in Harvey Smith's address in 1971, he showed the yields of the key crops, arable crops, from 1870 to 1970. And you can see that the yields were fairly low in the start of that period, um, around a tonne and a half per hectare for, for wheat, which is a solid line. Um, and I, they increased to around three tonnes per hectare by 1970. In the case of maize, it started around the three tonne per hectare in the, in the early 1900s. And that large increase that you see in the early 70s relates to the development of uh, maize hybrids. So the more recent trend has also been upwards in grain yields. Uh, let's start by looking at the green line, which is wheat, which has shown, seen a threefold increase in yields from uh, the 1960s, 70s through till today. And that yield has been fairly steady through the whole period of time, but there is a little bit of an increase from 1997-ish through to a bit more of an increase through till the early Oh, about 2010. I'd like to say that related to me being employed by FAR, but I don't think I can claim the credit for that, unfortunately. Um, there are a number of things going on at that time which resulted in those increases. There was a significant shift in the, in the growth to autumn sown wheats, which were higher yielding. There was also a significant uptake of the technologies that were being used in the UK, which resulted in increased in yields. And there was a significant increase in the genetics uh, brought in from Europe. And so those three things contributed to that increase at that time. The barley yields, the orange line, have just continued to increase at a pretty steady rate throughout that period. The blue line, the maize, um, has shown that increase early on due to the hybrids. But one of the really disappointing things with maize is that basically from 2000, early 2000s till today, there's been no significant increase. In fact, it's plateaued at around that 11 and a bit tonnes, um, in spite of all the effort that's gone in to produce new hybrids um, and to look at new growing agro agronomic inputs. Let's hone in on wheat a little bit more for a little while. Um, wheat, the average yield in the CPT, so that's the industry trials, has increased steadily at 200 kilograms per annum per hectare um, from about 2000. Um, and that's a reflection of the genetics and also the agronomics of producing wheat. So if we delve a bit more into what that contribution is, again, taking the data from the industry trials, which are, are run by FAR or managed by FAR, um, and taking a cultivar clear, which is the blue one, which was the standard in the trials from 2003 to 2015, and then looking at the difference between clear as the standard and the average yield of all the other cultivars in the trial, you can see that there's a significant increase in yield due to genetics. Now, the difference between clear and the average for those cultivars is 0.3 tons, so 20-odd kilos per hectare per year due to genetics. You've got to recognise that 
the difference between clear, the standard, and the best cultivars, so the significant gain from genetics would be much greater than that. There's also been a gain due to the agronomics, and if you looked at that graph and took the averages into, into effect for that, it would be about a ton and a bit um, over that period of time, so 70 odd kilos per year. So fairly significant gains from both agronomics and genetics for wheat. Wheat's not the only crop, or the cereals aren't the only crop that have shown significant increases in yield. Ryegrass seed yields have doubled in that same time frame, um, pretty much. It doesn't matter whether it's perennial, Italian, or hybrid. Now that's interesting because in the case of the grass seeds, the genetic gain from a seed yield perspective would be minimal because if any, because the selection has been is for forage types, so it would be for a whole heap of other factors, as long as they were reasonably good yielding um, from a seed yield perspective. So the major contribution to seed yield increases in ryegrass has been the agronomic um, inputs. So again, a very clear reflection of the great science that's been done by a whole heap of people operating in the ryegrass areas, uh, seed area, research areas. Irrigation has shown, shown a huge change across that same period of time. Irrigation has enabled us to grow a wider range of crops, both vegetables for largely for processing in Canterbury, um, but also the seed crops. And over 75% of those crops of both, both types are grown on irrigated land. Irrigation has also provided the opportunity to significantly increase yields. Um, there is discussion as to its impacts on soil quality, and some data shows that it's reduced soil quality, some data shows there's improvements. And well-managed irrigation uh, reduces environmental impacts because it enables the farmers to effectively utilise the nutrients in the soil profile and reduce the losses due to leaching. So the yield benefits have been significant. And again, this is taking the data from the CPT trials and looking at the differences in the average yield for the dryland trials and the irrigated trials over that period of time. And it sits at about 2.85 tonnes per hectare, which at the price of wheat currently would be a little bit over $1,720-odd per hectare for the um, that extra return from irrigation. Obviously, irrigation has benefits in other crops as well. So we're seeing significant yield increases in crops such as peas and grass. And the top table there is for peas. Um, and it shows that different application timings of irrigation had differing impacts on the increase in yield over the null control. So that applying, and I haven't shown all of the treatments in this table, there's a number of other treatments, but I just selected three of these to highlight the um, impacts. So the response from applying three applications, only three applications as compared to 12 if it was fully irrigated, um, was an increase of 0.5 tonnes over the nil. If we had a, nine applications from mid-season right through flowering to harvest, it was 0.9. And if you had the full a application to fully irrigate the crop, it was 1.2 tonnes. The interesting thing is that maximising the yield through irrigation with the cost of water does not necessarily result in the best return. So that in the um, right-hand column there, you'll see that the best return actually came from um, not applying the water early in the season and focusing on that mid to late period of time. In ryegrass, again, significant increases in yield from the dryland crops, so about a tonne in the case of the perennial and slightly more than that in the case of the Italian, and so significant increases in returns to the growers. 
In the case of nitrogen, um, we see significant increases and in, or changes in nitrogen use in response to the to the research that went on. So in the early 90s, increases from 80 to 120 kilos that then increased based on the fact that the nitrogen was being uptaken by the plant to between 120 to from 120 to as high as 300, which if you look at the graph, you can see that put it into the luxury uptake, but the nitrogen was being taken up by the plant. In the 2000s, there was a decrease in nitrogen as we understood more about the where the maximum seed yield was, and that now sits at about 185 if you look at the combination of the nitrogen, soil N, N and the applied N. Pillage practices have changed as well. So this is a, from a, some survey work that FAR did in 2011. Um, you'll see on the right hand side there that there's a large number of percentage of people ploughing and that's dropped quite markedly. The major increase change was to reduce tillage, so to two passes, but there's a small increase um, in that period of five years in the number of people doing direct drilling. And direct drilling or reducing tillage is having a number of benefits to growers as well as reducing the costs of cultivation. It also has the impacts such as increasing the water holding capacity. Um, you can see as you move from the full inversion tillage to no tillage, there's increases in the water holding capacity of the soil irrespective of the, whether it's dry land or irrigated. And other benefits are in soil quality, and you can see here the difference in the aggregate stability or the amount of um, sediments in the two vessels. Um, these soil samples were taken from side by side in the same paddock uh, from cultivated and no-till areas. Pest and disease has changed quite markedly as well. So we all heard, heard about glyphosate and uh, the bans, the things about cancer, but it's absolutely an essential tool for reducing tillage. Similar things with neonicotinoids, bans, um, and the impacts on beneficial insects, bans in some parts of the world, not in New Zealand. Um, resistance to all of the groups of agrochemicals being quite major concerns. A limited number of new registrations, Increased emphasis on biopesticides, endophytes, IPM, etc., and increased concerns um, and recognition of the value of biodiversity, um, both from an ecosystem services perspective, but also from the markets. And the consumers are showing some interest in reduced spray products and to a lesser extent, probably organics, particularly within New Zealand, we're not really seeing much shift. Herbicide resistance in New Zealand, some work Trevor James um, put together, shows a large increase in a in number of species with resistance from 1980 through to 2016 odd. So now at that time had over 25 species. Not all of these species are within arable, but quite a number of them are applicable to arable farming as well. The major concern being glyphosate. So on the Left hand side there, you'll see that from when glyphosate was first developed in 1974, there was not much increase in resistance until Roundup Ready Corn came into effect and a huge increase in resistance from that period of time um, to today. New Zealand hasn't been immune from resistance to glyphosate and the resistance that we're seeing in ryegrass is, is a major concern and some work that FAR have done shows that there's significant um, resistance there. So that if you look at those plants, as you move from left to right, it goes from zero to eight litres per hectare of glyphosate applied. And even at eight litres per hectare, that plant is on the right there is still surviving. Hmm. What are the solutions for this? This increased, increased interest in cover crops, IPM um, prediction, those sorts of things. So hopefully they can come to play. In the seed area, as I've said, we're a world leader in vegetable seeds due to the climate and, and the genetics. Um, and we have 
carrot and radish being number one in the world for production of those. Climate, they're grass seeds, endophytes, and forage genetics are make sure at the forefront there and cereal seeds we do a bit of out of season production but we produce very high quality seed and it would be nice to think that at some point in the future we'll be producing cereal seeds for our near neighbour across the ditch who are struggling with the impacts of climate on their seed production. There have been a limited number of innovative products coming out of the arable industry unfortunately. One of the innovative ones is the Avenex grasses which were developed by AgriSearch and PGG Wrightsons and these grasses have an endophyte which um, reduces insect feeding and also has a taste aversion to birds therefore reducing the number of birds at airports and has huge potential to reduce bird strike. The uptake of that has been relative, it's not as great as what I would have expected internationally due to a whole heap of safety concerns um, and the, the very safety conscious aviation industry. However, there's real potential for the use of these sorts of grasses in turf areas to reduce the impacts of birds and they're used on a number of sports fields throughout New Zealand now, but uptake internationally isn't as great as I would have thought. Technology, yield maps, when they first had the when we first had the potential to yield map in the mid 90s, I thought this was going to revolutionise our understanding and management of farms. But because of the variability from season to season and the fact that we had crop rotations, you didn't see consistent trends in the paddocks. So it wasn't really until about 2016 or thereabouts when far started looking at making profit maps that farmers really started to take notice and recognised that those areas that are red in that graph, they were making a loss on that part of the paddock and they started to think about how they should farm that part of the paddock or their, those parts of their farm differently, either by improving the production or not farming them for that use at all. Knowledge exchange is something the arable industry has had a real focus on. It has a large number of very skilled people out talking with farmers on a on a day to day basis, and some things have been taken up incredibly well. And it comes down to what they are, and adding something to what you already do is very relatively easy. So modus and ryegrass, from when it was first researched, um, there was very rapid uptake, and that was because it was a simple technology for farmers to implement. The response was immediate, the response was large, there were no enduring side effects or downsides, um, and so there was 80% uptake over, over two years. Um, another piece of research that was done was some work on pea fertilisers. So there's over 15 years of research done on pea fertilisers, and, and that work showed that there was no significant benefit to applying fertiliser to peas. If you looked across the research that was done, there was some things, there was some data suggesting or indicating there was losses of a um, re yield due to fertiliser and some of that was due to fertiliser burning. There was loss of um, seed that didn't emerge due to fertiliser burning and there was the cost of the fertiliser. So there was extra costs of maybe 250 odd dollars per hectare, but farmers didn't take that up. And we were trying to suggest to them they should stop doing something they'd always done. And as well as that, we had um, people supporting the use of fertiliser, even though there was no benefit to the farmer, farming community. So just getting to finish, um, one of the things that the industry has been very good at measuring is their success, particularly at the pub. And so the highest yields always occurred in the pub. But they are not very. We haven't been very good at looking at how to compare yields or production across paddocks, um, and the yield tends to be of the crop. So if you looked at a wheat crop, it might be 12 tons or it might be eight tons. But there was no consideration for the fact that the eight-ton crop was spring sown and the 12-ton crop was um, autumn sown. So if we convert those numbers to the gross margins per hectare per day it starts to really reflect some of what's going on for farmers. And some things, two crops in this slide that are not necessarily that popular with farmers for whatever reasons, cereal, silage, um, spring irrigated, once you go to gross margins per hectare per day, 
at a significantly high, higher dollars per hectare than for feed barley taken through to grain. Similarly, the pea seed and peas are a crop which farmers say doesn't make money, but if you look at it in dollars per hectare per day, it certainly is one of the more profitable crops. Just to finish, where to from here? Um, there's a number of drivers which are going to take the in or impact on the industry going forward, and those drivers there are at the bottom of the slide, so climate change, all of the things that you're well familiar with, food security, um, quarantine, biodiversity, etc. And they need to be looked at in relation to what's our competitive advantage. And our competitive advantage is around some things such as trust, stability, our innovativeness, our uptake of technologies, but very importantly, the climate which we farm with this water that we have available in the soils that we are not degraded. And those competitive advantages then need to be looked at to, as to how we produce foods that for the future around whether they're safe, whether there's controlled production systems, um, and also particularly going forward, and hopefully there'll be some further debate or discussion around this as how we use genetic tools to produce food. The other approach is the modern farming systems um, and how they're driven by technology, how we integrate regenerative rating systems into the farm system and how we put all that together to capture the value from our farm system or look at how we create more value and how we capitalise on our uniqueness around te ao Māori. And hopefully that will lead to an integrated land use going forward. So I'll stop there and hopefully you've been able to um, share that with me and uh, we can um, yeah, I don't think there's time for questions. So I wish you all the best for the rest part, rest of the conference, um, and hope it's been of some interest. So, um, on behalf of the um, the group gathered here, Nick, I'd like to thank you for an interesting and um, walk through the 50 years of agronomy. Um, highlighting some of the successes and some of the challenges that remain, and I'm sure it's given us all food for thought for the remaining parts of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.